I think we've officially reached the middest point of the series, at least the beginning of that. Season 8 began by forcing us to consider the merits of Andy Bernard as manager. And now, we're just like busy with things. How did I get this long triangle? Hey everybody, I'm Chris and I'm reviewing every episode of The Office ever. And today, along with the rest of The Office staff, we're looking at Pam's replacement. Even I want some fries with that shake. Aesthetically speaking, yeah. strictly. Yeah, yeah, she adds a nice present. I got a chance to meet Lindsay Broad, the actress who plays Kathy Sims earlier this year, and she was a delightful human being. She wasn't opposed to being on this series, but that sad, sad DM she asked me to send is just left in the unread abyss. All right, Pam's replacement. We have drama, intrigue, foreshadowing, and an interesting callback to other points in the series. So, so much to get to, let's go. I say we start there. With, With the, the crotch? crotch? With the crotch. I understand nothing. All right, the callbacks start with the cold opening. Maybe callback isn't the right word. Maybe homage or maybe just the series has ran for like seven years at this point and the writers forgot that The Office already did it. But either way, Andy, like Michael before him, is attempting to have his secretary interrupt a meeting with a private message in order to look busier and thus more important. It's like a humble version of a power move. Michael's backfired in spectacular fashion. I insist you take your work calls. Hi, buddy. And Andy's backfires when Aaron fails to fully understand the assignment and provides this very detailed death in the family scenario. Your mother is dead. It's the police. They said it's the worst they've ever seen. Really, my aim is to look as satisfied with my work as Aaron does in this cold opening. So Pam's replacement begins by introducing us to Kathy Sims, her temporary replacement in the office for her made up job. Now, Pam's looming pregnancy was mentioned first in the season opener. Right here, little Michael Scott. Nope, I told you I don't like that joke. But it takes center stage in this episode. And look, I'm me. I have never been nor ever will be pregnant. I have no firsthand idea of what carrying a human inside of you does to you physically, emotionally, psychologically, all of the things that it can do to a person, I have no point of reference for that. But this episode was written by a woman, so I'm gonna have to trust the commentary as written, paired with what I've watched my wife and several of our friends go through over the years. Pam is dealing with some rough changes to her body, and all of that is reinforced by the smallest adult in the office. Oh, come on, you really think I'm gonna have a 14 pound baby? This feels like the kind of episode that should have happened back in season five during Pam's first pregnancy, but Fisher wasn't really pregnant back then and she was during season eight. So this episode does entangle the actress with the character in some interesting nebulous ways. Who knows? It's nebulous. But all of those feelings and insecurities are colliding and they're exacerbated by Andy bringing in the new temp, Tris. Okay, I'm sorry. To take over the duties for a job which Pam has made up for the last year. I'm the office administrator. Which involves purchasing office supplies, coordinating other major purchases, casual bribery, and the like. For some reason, Jim seems to be training Kathy also for Pam's job. Well, we know why. It's because they needed to force the drama so that Pam could lean into that chaos a bit. But I'm gonna give him a pass because it basically, it happened so quickly and smoothly, I didn't pick up on it the first few times I watched this episode. And since she's taken Pam's desk, it kind of just works out. For all of these reasons, combined with the montage explaining how everyone treats you differently when you're pregnant, Pam's jealous concern drives her into trusting Dwight, as his complete lack of filter for the truth is something that she's valuing at the moment. The two of them work together to fish out if Jim thinks that Kathy is attractive or not which she objectively is, something which most of the office agrees on. Do you think she's hot? No. Nope. Her breasts are large, her waist is small, her reproductive health and ample evidence and facial symmetry. Come on. It's gonna be nice to have just like a healthy, young, fit presence in the middle of the office. Yeah. There's something so office about this scene in the break room, by the way, it's like a microcosm for the series. It's something that starts relatively normal and something to cringe at. That's the best way to land a hot girlfriend. You just, uh, you get her hooked on blow. But it gets weirder and weirder and weirder as it goes on. That would be the hottest thing ever. Is a pregnant Helen Mirren. Oh. oh. It's one of the most common fetishes. 
I do love seeing Dwight and Pam work together. It plays on this friendship that they've developed over the years, and this episode takes them to some crazy places. You came to the right person. You have to follow your intuition, Pam. It is called the matchmaker test, and it is very powerful. We have Pam ask Jim which of his friends he would set up with Kathy. If Jim picks a really hot friend, he thinks that Kathy's hot. The scene does make me wonder if the matchmaker test is a real thing or if this was just written by Kaling. It does feel on brand as something Kaling's done before in real life. So like many things with this character and actress, it kind of becomes nebulous. Who knows? It's nebulous. Second time I've been able to use that clip. Speaking of that, I genuinely do wonder who this guy is. Mike Tibbetts, the actor, not the character. We know a bit about the character. Mike Tibbetts is like the most boring looking guy I know, so. I searched and I couldn't find anything on this guy. Maybe it's just a stock image, or maybe it was one of the writer's cousins or something, or maybe it's something glaringly obvious that I'm just missing. Leave it in the comments if you know. When I searched Google for that image, I got Mike Tibbet memes and a picture of John Favreau. Moving from Kelly's crazy to Dwight's crazy. I say we start there. With the, the crotch? crotch? With the crotch. Dwight attempts to get his hands on the evidence. I'm gonna walk over here. Whoa, whoa, I'm slipping and falling. I'm stumbling, I need something to grab onto. Uh, hey, Dwight. are you okay? I'm Dwight. fine, I'm totally Dwight. fine. Dwight, yes. A scene I enjoy more because I know these bloopers exist. What? I lost my balance. Please leave. What? Why? <laughs> <laughs> the B-plot of Pam's replacement introduces us to Kevin and the Zits. Kevin and the Zits. That was never agreed upon. Who's slowly being replaced throughout this episode by the likes of Steve Moore, aka the internet's favorite mad drummer from that video that went viral so long ago that by the time this episode aired, I was like, is that that guy from that one video? Joined by Linda Taylor, who plays guitar for one of Michael's favorite shows. Whose line is it anyway? And Robin Swinson, who's toured and recorded as a member of Frankie Valli and the Four Seasons, Air Supply, and others. Shaka Khan. Are you serious? From Star Trek? I like this B-plot because, again, I kind of like how the series uses Ed Helms' musical talents, and it may have the best joke in the episode. Nice scatting, man. Thank you. I think I said dupe instead of boop at one point. The trio initially invite Robert to join as a zit, but he brings in his own crew and they take over the band. I think the music left without you. In the end, the original members head outside to make some sweet low fidelity music that is a solid concession to the limelight that was the warehouse stage. Meanwhile, things are heating up upstairs. Dwight had this idea and I thought it was kind of crazy, but maybe that's where we are now. So like I do, let me ask you this. If we're tipping the scales of what's the right thing to do here, should Jim say that he finds her attractive and just say the truth? Or should he keep it zipped up like he does? Leave your thoughts in the comments. So the crew heads to the drugstore to give Jim a makeshift lie detector test. And just for free here, real lie detector tests are generally considered flawed and unreliable, not to mention generally inadmissible as evidence to the courts. But real polygraph machines at least measure out multiple things to sniff out a lie, like heart rate, perspiration, blood pressure, and even respiration. The liar will perspire. The cuff here really wouldn't flesh out any results at all, but... Oh, that's what they taught me in my 19th century kindergarten. And around the same time Kevin and the Zits realize that there's no replacement for their friendship, Pam's equally snapped out of her hormone-driven bout of insecure madness after Dwight's test accidentally reveals that Jim may have high blood pressure. And we close on this fantastic talking head with just one of the best redirects in the late office writing. I had feelings for a co-worker today that I haven't had in years. In my defense, he was grabbing my crotch fairly aggressively at the time. But with that, we have so much more to talk about, so let's dive into the deeper meaning. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kevin. It's funny in the Pam hate video I made a couple years ago that I mentioned honesty is a big deal for the couple. And generally speaking, that is true, I think. Uh, but that is a comment that triggered a lot of people in the comments, which I get. Pam has been known to fib here and there. I've been known to bend the truth. Damn yes. it. Pam, get out right now. Leave it. I mean it. Get the hell out of here. But Jim is straight up lying to his lady love in this episode, and I find it really interesting. It calls into question what place deception has in modern relationships. I've mentioned before that I think I'm kind of weird, but I remember real young 
my mom telling me that she appreciated how honest I was if she were to ask me how she looked in something. Now, I personally would never take fashion advice from me, which is why my wife does all my shopping. But anyway, when my mom would ask me anything, I'd be like, no, I don't like that. As time went on, reality has its way of teaching me lessons. Lessons like not everything that I think true as it may be, no matter how concrete in my head that truth is, it doesn't always have to leave my lips. Timing, phrasing, and messaging can all be crafted in ways so the person hearing it can be able to respond in a way that is beneficial to them and like me in the process. I'm not gonna tell my nine months pregnant wife that I find her replacement objectively attractive. It's true, but it doesn't help anybody. So personally, I side with Jim here, even though Kathy is objectively attractive. And I don't think it would have been wrong just to say that because those things aren't like mutually exclusive, right? You can objectively find someone attractive and then objectively find your own wife attractive. I do side with Jim here on censoring his words. Even if Kathy is objectively attractive, Pam's tendency would be to compare her current state to Kathy's current state. It would be true, so Jim speaking the truth here would be honest, but it doesn't make it wise. And someone's comprehension of what our truth is matters, sometimes at least. That's all I'm saying. And if their understanding of what you're saying is limited due to bias, stupidity, or in this case, hormone-driven insecurity, then it will probably do more damage than good. And for me, that's the only way I question this episode. Reading comments on the Pam hating video, I the episode is often cited as red flags for Pamela, and I don't think I have much commentary personally there. Well, I do, but we're, we're going to get there in a minute. So let's take a look from Pam's side. She begins with curiosity, but she doesn't exactly enter panic mode until she sees Jim making Kathy laugh, which probably brings up some vibes of when Pam was with someone else and Jim used to flirt and make her laugh. She knows that her husband uses his sense of humor, and it's not like there's zero reason for concern because affairs like this happen all the time, maybe as often as bands break up or replace their members. This tendency to lose attraction for our mates is more than just a sitcom trope. It's a thing, like in our species. I can't promise you that I'll never cheat on you, nor should I. Modern marriages aren't built that way. Men aren't built that way. There's a very interesting article I can email to you. Barf! Oh, you suck! Much to my wife's dismay, I spent a little time thinking about this this last week, it's maybe like this leftover trait from our more animalistic roots in which the driving factor inside of us, biologically speaking, was less about loyalty to individuals and more about the perpetuation of our species. It's been said after all that only 3% of mammals are actually monogamous. But while there is a much higher percentage rate of monogamy in primates, it is still a relatively rare trait. So the monkey does the sex thing right here. <laughs> a trait that as far as we could tell, it's kind of normal for us. So either through evolution or through societal factors, we, the hairless apes of the primate family, have learned to value these things, generally speaking, like long-term monogamous relationship commitments. And personally, I'm on board. I enjoy the benefits of this framework of marriage because I myself have gone from attractive young Chris, if I don't say so myself, to a very Mike Tibbetts-esque stage that lasted way longer than I care to admit until finally I started exercising and learned how to cover up half my face with my beard. Now, while I think I look like I belong catching chipmunks to use for my own benefit, my wife kind of digs me. And that fact that I can exist in this world, going through life, knowing that she thinks I'm the bee's knees, even when I used to look like this, and that I will probably look like this in the future when I'm back to being what Kelly would describe as a crime against humanity. It's called being a nice person. It means that life is simpler now and it's so much easier and I don't need to be on the prowl shopping all the time because I already got the goods at home. And that same level of commitment that she has shown me makes it so it's really easy to reciprocate, which leads to less insecurity and more contentment. And in the state of mutual commitment and security, it makes honest communication a whole heck of a lot easier. Boom, marriage advice, kind of. Really, the goal is to lean on each other, just like Dwight on Jim. I'm sorry, I fell down, Mr. Balance. And that guy at the company picnic. Yeah, you don't grab these for balance. So with that, let's rate this thing. 
This is the worst. <laughs> Hey everybody, do all the YouTube stuff. I really appreciate it. So for the cold opening, I think I kind of love this at every level. Andy's idea is stupid. You're not just, gonna Just it. make up a phone call. It's not a real call. Oh. And I think it's great for the character. Erin doesn't just not get it. She's knocking it out of the park with this very detailed plot line and backstory. She was hit by a bus. They said it's the worst they've ever seen. And back up. Erin told me to pretend to be a cop and say your mom died. Oh. Really, it's a fantastic bit. And in a post Michael office, we haven't seen many cold openings that bring this compelling little mini plot, laughs, energy, tension, and some really solid fun. So I'm gonna give this a five out of five. As for the episode itself, this isn't bad television, which makes doing these ratings in season eight kind of hard. A Cindy White of IGN said that this episode needed a stronger A plot. And instead, what we got were two tasty side dishes, which was not my nickname in high school. Really, when I read that, I couldn't get anything else out of my head. It feels like both of these are worthy B plots. While the titular story takes the A plot status, it's mostly due to the screen time it got and not because of the depth it delivers. On one hand, I appreciate that this is taking a stab at something that feels real, right? On the other hand, there's just not much substance here. Does your husband have very soft directions? I forgot that this episode actually existed. In fact, I watched this episode the Friday before I published the Doomsday Field Guide, and then I started writing immediately. By Sunday, when I had a second to write some more, I couldn't even remember this episode at all. Further to that point, I watched this episode like three times yesterday just to reinforce what this episode was about, rather than just getting lost on this newspaper that's foreshadowing Pam's future. And also waiting for Dwight to touch Jim's goodie bits. The B-plot is insubstantial, albeit heartwarming, and those feels are intended to seep into the drama with Jim and Pam, so they do work together in that way. Thank you. Baby, I love you every day. It's not a bad episode, but it is so, so forgettable. It's like eating cotton candy. I'm going to give this one a two out of five. Ew, Kelly, calm down. But that's all I have to say about Pam's replacement. Join me next week for one of the lowest rated episodes in the entire season. It's going to be a great time when DM does GB. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.